Tinnitus is the presence of a, of a sound that a person hears with no external sound. So tinnitus is described in many, many different ways. I've heard buzzing, hissing, chirping, bees, cicadas on a summer night, frogs on a summer night. So the manifestation of tinnitus can be many, many, many different things. And so when I take the history, I want to know when it started. I want to know what it sounds like. And one important break point of tinnitus is whether it pulsates or is it just a, a high pitched tone? Um, a pulsatile tinnitus kind of puts things in a different category for me. But most of the time people describe a high pitched tone, a buzzing, a chirping, a hissing. And so those are the symptoms. And all a patient has to do is tell me that and they have the diagnosis of, of tinnitus. So it's important to know that tinnitus is a symptom and not a diagnosis. Many times it's up to me or, or other ear specialists to determine maybe what is the diagnosis that is causing the tinnitus. One of the important questions that I ask my patients is what is the frequency of your tinnitus? How often do you hear it? A lot of patients say during the day when I'm busy, I'm running my errands, I'm doing my thing, I really don't pay attention to it or I don't hear it. It's when it's quiet, like at night when they're trying to go to sleep or trying to read. And so many times it's every night that they hear it. And one of my key points in trying to manage or help patients manage tinnitus is what is its effect on their quality of life? And to get to that, the answer to that question, there are three fundamental questions that I ask patients. Number one, does it wake you out of sleep in the middle of the night? Number two, does it keep you from falling asleep? And number three, during the day, if you're busy, you're running your errands, can you ignore it? So that helps me kind of get to the quality or the how debilitating uh, the tinnitus is to a patient's quality of life. There's no question that there are triggers for tinnitus. People will come in and say, I went to a rock concert and my ears have been ringing ever since. And we call that acoustic trauma. So any noise exposure, whether it's occupational noise exposure around a factory work or engines or power tools or recreational noise exposure, rock concerts, firearm use, that is definitely a trigger for tinnitus. And that's why we're so adamant about hearing conservation. You know, when we lose our hearing, we don't get it back. Those tiny little cells inside the cochlea that we call hair cells, when they die, they don't regenerate. And that's kind of the holy grail of our specialty, how to get those hair cells to regenerate. But they're definitely triggers for tinnitus. And for patients who have baseline tinnitus, so they have tinnitus that, you know, fluctuates over the course of their lives, I really cite five fundamental stresses. I call them stresses, you can call them triggers. Uh, and those triggers include chemical stresses like caffeine, alcohol, aspirin, high doses of ibuprofen, Advil, Motrin. They're definitely medications that can trigger or increase, ramp up the tinnitus. Acoustic stress we talked about, that's recreational or occupational noise, loud sounds. Um, physical stress, so if you have a fever, a flu, a sinus infection, any physical stress will make the ringing go louder. Once you recover from the physical stress, the ringing kind of dies down or goes back to its baseline. Pathologic stress is my job. Maybe you have a wax impaction in your ear canal. Maybe you have a hole in your eardrum or you have fluid in your middle ear or you have most commonly what I see is sensory neural hearing loss. And that's hearing loss usually in the high frequencies that affects mostly adults, uh, can affect children, but can definitely be at the heart or at the root of tinnitus. And finally, and perhaps more, uh, more to a patient's um, anxiety, the, the last trigger is stress. Trouble at home, trouble at work, on the job, wherever. And for a subset of patients, it's the tinnitus itself that is the stress. The more they hear it, the louder it gets, the louder it gets, the more the stress they are about it. And the more stressed they are about it, the more they're focused on it. And it's more difficult to, to, to get it at least back to a manageable situation. It's estimated that about 10 to 15% of the American population experiences tinnitus. 
And that could amount to as many as 20 to 50 million Americans. Now, not all people with tinnitus are intensely bothered by their tinnitus. So it's estimated about, about, about five to 10 million Americans have some bothersome tinnitus, but generally we can, we can manage it. It, it. And really it's about managing it and helping patients cope with it. And probably it's estimated two million patients are really fairly debilitated by their tinnitus. In other words, it's hard to get their, their lives together. It's hard to do their daily activities. It's hard to get to sleep or they can't get to sleep. So um, it really runs the gamut from, I hear it, but I don't pay attention to it, to I can't read, I can't focus, I can't live my life with the tinnitus the way it is. I've definitely seen an uptick in tinnitus since the pandemic started. It's hard to know whether it's the viral infection itself or could it just be the stress? You know, I mentioned a second ago, emotional stress can definitely be a trigger or can, can ramp up the tinnitus. And so we've been under a lot of stress with the coronavirus pandemic. And so that could also be playing a role in, uh, in the creation of, of tinnitus. It's hard to know whether there's a neurologic effect of the infection that is causing tinnitus. There, there are just so many different causes. It's really hard to pinpoint one. You know, a lot of people do have some high frequency, meaning the, in the high, high tones, sensory neural hearing loss, nerve hearing loss. And that's probably the most common source or the most common cause of tinnitus. And then you have another, what we call environmental factor that then impacts the tinnitus. Um, and certainly COVID is, is one of them. And whether it's, whether it's a, a purely neurologic phenomenon or whether it's a stress phenomenon or whether it's some other issue that's going on, it's really hard to kind of parse that out. So if someone is experiencing tinnitus, there are several options or several levels of, of treatment. First and foremost is try to identify those triggers that we talked about. And there's a mnemonic that I use, C-A-P-P-E. So chemical, acoustic, physical, pathologic stress, and emotional stress. So if you have any of those kind of stressors, you gotta, gotta work on the stress. Second, and probably the most common um, treatment that people do, and a lot of people find this out on their own, is to use a little bit of background noise whether it's a fan at night or the television at night or radio or one of these sound machines that takes white noise and makes it into the ocean, you know, the rainforest or a thunderstorm, that external sound can be very effective at masking, and that's what we call them, tinnitus maskers, at masking your own internal noise so that you can sleep, so that you can focus, so that you can concentrate. I actually have an app on my phone called Rain Rain, and that, that phone app is great. It takes white noise, makes it into the ocean or the, or the rainforest, so it can be very, very effective in helping patients cope or, or manage their tinnitus. One time I did an Amazon search. I think there are about 1,500 different supplements that are touted as cure your tinnitus. Be careful. Don't waste your money is kind of what I say. There has been no randomized clinical trial that has shown efficacy of any of these supplements in the management or in curing tinnitus. There is certainly a placebo effect. So you figure, you know, I've paid this money and I'm taking this medication and it's gonna help. But I have to say, hey, really beware of, uh, of those supplements that, uh, that are touted as uh, relieving or curing your tinnitus. They've not been shown to be systematically effective in, uh, in tinnitus relief. We talked about kind of a break point in tinnitus, two different kinds of tinnitus. One is just a high pitch, constant tone, crickets, cicadas, bees, whatever. The other bucket of tinnitus is pulsatile. Um, whether it's a clicking in the ear or whether you hear your pulse in the ear, um, those patients, well, any patient with tinnitus, I would recommend seeing, at least getting a hearing test, a baseline hearing test, and maybe seeing a doctor about their tinnitus. But the patients who come in saying, I hear my pulse in my ear, and really and truly, it's the kind of sound that when the ultrasonographer or the obstetrician puts the ultrasound transducer on the pregnant woman's tummy and listens to the baby's heartbeat, that that is 
something that should you should seek medical attention about. We have to find there's some vascular reason, there's some blood vessel reason, whether it's a venous a problem with a vein or problem with a, an artery or a blood vessel, that we need to look into a little bit further. So for those patients, I would definitely say seek medical attention. It's so interesting to hear the duration of tinnitus that people suffer. I, I've seen patients that have said, I had this terrible tinnitus, it lasted three months and then it went away. Uh, it's three years and it went away. And then yes, I have seen patients who have had tinnitus all their lives or at least all of their adult lives. And we, we help them manage the tinnitus or cope with the tinnitus. As I, as I mentioned, there is there is no cure. There's no magic bullet, no no magic pill that's, that we can give to, to cure tinnitus. We are avidly working on cures or treatment for sensory neural hearing loss. This is the, the most common type of hearing loss that we get. Most of us will have some sensory neural hearing loss uh, as we age, as we get older. And so the day that we find a cure or we have treatment for sensory neural hearing loss is the day that, that I think many patients' tinnitus will be very much relieved or alleviated. And what is, what is interesting is for patients with severe to profound hearing loss, these are patients in whom a hearing aid is no longer of any benefit. These are the patients who are candidates for the cochlear implant, an implant that goes into the ear that can restore hearing in patients with severe to profound hearing loss. And what cochlear implant patients tell me is that when they're wearing their cochlear implant, they don't hear the tinnitus. So when you've got some external stimulation, whether it's from a cochlear implant, whether it's from a fan at night, whether it's from a sound machine, TV, or radio, I think that is an, a very effective measure to help alleviate tinnitus. Tinnitus can be tormenting. There's, there's no question about it. And while there's no cure, there are medications that can help with sleep. There are also strategies like cognitive behavioral therapy to help patients cope and manage their tinnitus. It's funny, some patients that are really bothered by their tinnitus, I will send to yoga. Yoga is great, not only is it a good exercise, but the meditative aspects of yoga help patients to lower their pulse, lower their blood pressure, lower that, we call it the autonomic nervous system response, the fight or flight response, because when they hear the tinnitus, the blood pressure goes up, the pulse goes up. And yoga teaches you how to lower the pulse, lower the blood pressure, lower that stress response so that you can better cope with the tinnitus.